Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. I mean, I think about the power of words. People have labeled themselves. We self-identify so much based on something that was probably said to us when we were in very formative years, mm-hmm. early school years. But that idea that we're not creative, to, to say those words are actually very wounding. And so students will come to me in, in a class and they'll say, oh, I would take that class, but I'm not very creative. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right? Just like this, the person who says like, oh, I can't draw. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm always like, can you take a pencil and... <laughs> drag it across a piece of paper because that is officially a drawing. (laughs) Today we're talking to Professor of Art at Wheaton College, David Hooker. Thank you for joining us, David. Thanks for having me. We invited him to join us because we discovered that David uses in some of his art classes a book written by one of our authors at The Wade, The Mind of the Maker by Dorothy Sayers. So, David, why don't you first tell us how you discovered the mind of the maker? I came to it kind of, uh, kind of late, uh, like I did actually most of the Wade authors. Um, I, we yeah. had uh, a lot of Tolkien in our house. My dad was a huge Tolkien mm-hmm. fan. Um, but I, it, it all seemed like too complicated for me. I, I never actually <laughs> understood it, but... When I was uh, actually came to Wheaton College, um, I think Joel Sheasley, who was at the time the painting professor here, um, introduced me to it because of some interest I had in some other authors like Flannery O'Connor, mm. and uh, I was really looking for um, authors who were talking about art and theology, and um, that it was one of the one of the books that was recommended to me and I kind of found it that way. And actually that's what started me loving Dorothy Sayers. Mm. I had never actually read any Dorothy Sayers, mm. which was crazy because I love murder mysteries. Oh, And then all of a sudden I found out that she wrote murder mysteries. And then I had to read every murder mystery she wrote because they're amazing. So. Yeah. Well, which is your favorite detective novel of, of Sayers? Sayers. <laughs> Probably nine Taylors. Nine Taylors. Yeah, nine well, Taylors. It's about the beauty of art, right? About this amazing architecture. And the music and the, the amount of, I mean, I realize, of course, there's a sort of musical form with bells that I knew, mm. not, you know, I mm. sort of thought I knew but didn't know. And the amount of research she did and the way she sort of explained it was just like, I love that. I've always loved authors who, um, who are able to sort of make a place fully alive, mm. like the setting of the place. So like one of my early authors that I loved with Th- was Thomas Hardy uh, uh. for the same kind of mm. reason. Um, so Sayers was like, like the perfect, like, like Thomas Hardy as a mystery writer was sort mm. of like Dorothy Sayers mm. to me. So I, I, I just fell well, in love with her immediately. She would love that. Yeah. Interpreters uh, why to try to find out why she named the bells, what she named them, or why she called them angel roofs. And you go over there, and those are the names of the bells. I could totally believe it. Yeah. yeah. And One the time, angel roof, there really are carved angels. It, it's a very yeah. characteristic feature of that part of England. Cool. So sometimes the literary interpreters work too hard to figure out <laughs> right, why right. somebody put something yeah, into that yeah, story. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. David and I actually did an angel roof tour when I was working mm. on my book on Sayers nice. and they are just exquisite. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the artistry of these and they're way up in the rafters. And so you can barely see them and it's about beauty for its own sake. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and I think that appeals to me as a craft person. I have my mm. MFA is in ceramics. And so, um, yeah, and that, there's a whole other questions about like, um, like what's your actual motivation for doing things and, you know, sort of these, these craftspeople who, you know, would, would do something like that where nobody's going to see it, but would still spend the time to Mm -hmm. actually make it beautiful or, or, you know, stories about locksmiths who are building these locks and you open up these, these old locks and they're full of like etched uh, images in there, in the lock itself. So, Mm. um, that is so cool. Yeah. That's sort of a bucket list tour for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I kind of, a uh, a bit of an Anglophile and uh, my family history is connected to England, Ireland, and, but I've never really got a chance to spend time there. So mm. Hopefully one day. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. There's a story about uh, the sculptor working on a gargoyle, which is way up high. And somebody asks, why are you spending so much time on that? No one can see it. And he says, God sees it. Mm. That's kind of a yeah, right. Sayer's idea. Yeah, yeah. So what class or classes do you require your students to read The Mind of the Maker? Um, required reading for, um, of all things, Sculpture One. Interesting. <laughs> really? And now uh, explain that. Well, part of it is that uh, here we do um, a number of studio classes as sort of the gen ed requirements, uh, hmm. what, you know, is, is Christ at the core uh, here. So there's certain tags that students have to get. Um, the Sculpture One class is one of my sort of classes for that. And um, I originally did it sort of because I needed to uh, to make the the tag right to make it part of the gen ed i needed to bring in a sort of theological component Uh Uh um and so i was familiar with the text and i sort of started there in a way as just like oh i'll put it in here and this way we'll have this conversation but what i have just what i really love about um mind of the maker in particular is that um it actually is a radically readjusting of what it means to be an artist and what it means to, mm. and, and how to approach art. Mm. And so for students who, you know, most, a lot of that class is not art majors, but students who are taking it because they're trying to get their gen ed credit. Mm. So they may not know anything about art, but they were like, Oh, I'll get my hands dirty. Um, mm. But it gives me a chance to both um, cut through a whole spectrum of people, students who, or like this may be their only art experiment experience in college. Um, it's good for them, but it's also really good for people who are say art majors because it gives them a new way of thinking about what it is they're actually doing and, mm. and why it's important. Mm. I think we should do our listeners in a favor and someone should summarize the key ideas of the mind of the maker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that going to be David or is that going to be Crystal? Well, David, I I'll, I'll, I'll give you the basic, um, synopsis more or less the way i try to give it to students which is to say um well i should say maybe one of the things i absolutely love about the book is that it's written by an artist who Mm. knows theology Mm. it's not written about by a theologian right who is trying to figure out an argument for art and because she is an experienced fiction writer she's approaching it from an angle that i understand uh and i think that uh, that really resonates very differently. Although there's really good books by theologians writing about art, but they don't resonate the same way as this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, that's one of the things that I absolutely adore. So it, in a way, it sort of moves from an experiential point towards a theological point as opposed to the opposite. Mm. Um, but she um, she uses a Trinitarian model to explain the creative process for anybody doing anything creative. Uh, and so in her model, she's using the idea of God, the father is like the idea behind the creative pursuit. Um, uh, God, the son is like the activity of, uh, the pursuit. And, uh, then God, the Holy spirit is like the power in the creative pursuit. And then that's the more or less the premise of the book is like, you can kind of look at creativity as a sort of three-phased activity. And then what really the genius is, is that you start, by by using that model, you then gain an incredible amount of insights into into the creative act itself and the motivations behind a creative act. And also, on the reverse side, creativity gives you a lot of insights theologically. So Mm -hmm. it's sort of, it opens a bridge that's pretty... Yeah. Pretty special. It wasn't Sayer's surprise. She thought she was primarily writing about the creative process, yes. and everybody started treating her as a lay theologian. Yes, and I think she, in her introduction to it, she's, she makes pains to say, I'm not a theologian, or I'm not trying right. to write theology, which is hilarious because she's totally <laughs> writing theology. <laughs> um, but she wants to make, I think she's, my sense was that she, um, she wants to make sure people don't sort of like take her to task on minutia of points uh, uh minutia of theological points as she wants to right. say like like this is really like let's look at this as a 
let's hold this loosely. Let's not make it su- super tight, nailed down. Mm-hmm. But she's aware exactly. that would be a heresy to say there was, isn't there a heresy that says there was the, the age of the father and then the age of the son and then the age of the spirit? Uh, she was fascinated by heresies, but she made it clear that she didn't see this as, as being sequential. Yeah, it's always happening all the time. Right. And that is one of the huge, um, um, really breakthrough moments of the book that I love to take students through because when I, when you sort of sit down with, um, with almost anybody in society, but certainly students and you say, so tell me about, you know, what is, how does art work? They will say something like the general model that they'll say is sort of like, well, the artist has an idea. And then the artist creates uh, an artwork in which the idea is implanted in the artwork. And then the viewer sees the artwork. And if the artist is successful, then the um, artist, by looking at the, i uh, sorry, the viewer, by looking at the artwork, will see what the original idea was, which is the, which is the way we think about things. So, mm. you know, anytime... Um, and, and you approach as a viewer, most everybody as a viewer, um, pr- as looking at a new work, their initial question is, well, what is it about? So mm. it's the question you get as the artist all the time. What is your work about? Yes. Um, and so in that case, what that model says is that the artwork is a vehicle for an idea. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, and that's really all it is. And then you can, judge the quality of the art by judging whether or not you get to the original idea. Mm. Um, but as soon as you say it's the Trinity, like these things are actually in a Trinitarian relationship, l- the whole sequential structure is gone. Right. You mm-hmm. can't right. say that the God ex- existed before the sun. You can't say that the, that the sun existed before the Holy spirit. Um, you know, the, uh, if you were having that delusion, John one is going to blow that right out right. of the water for right. you. Um, but also you can't say that one is more important than the other. Uh, and you also have to say they are constantly in communication, in love. Mm. You can't actually separate them out. So suddenly the question, what is this about becomes meaningless, mm-hmm. uh, which say are multiple times in the book alludes back to. So mm-hmm. what's really fun is when I first, introduce the model to students they go oh i get it Mm. Mm. but they're actually just apply it to their old thought of of, right 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 and then i go do you really get it and then we (laughs) we actually start to talk well what does it mean what is the trinity and then all of a sudden they go wait what like you're (laughs) right you're telling me something entirely different and i'm like yeah and it was written you know like in the 1940s like it was written in 19 like what 41 i think 42? 40 it was published in 1941 yeah so published in 41 so um i mean the to me what's amazing is that it's it's at least at, at minimum 25 years ahead of the art world wow um it was a you know it's really i think it, there's so many connections to say the conceptual art movement of the 60s um mm-hmm that uh oh. it's it's kind of staggering there's um, a story about mozart that he sat down and played a composition of his at the piano and when he finished someone said what did that mean and he said this is what it meant and he sat down and, and played, played it, it again, again. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. yeah so yeah well, right. artists probably get tired of that question it, don't it, they? It, 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 it's annoying I, actually what's even worse is um you get it so much you start answering it which is oh. which is uh, absolutely the worst thing uh, like I, i've done that uh uh, multiple, I mean, I know I've done it multiple times, but there's times when somebody's asked me that question and I've sort of, you know, I just want to shortcut it. I don't want to try to like, right. So I, it's almost like you, you so say, you, okay, let's sit down yeah, and have right, a discussion right, about right, Trinitarian right, theology. Right. The, the, and so the, you're, you're sort of stuck in the place where, uh, as an artist, um, you have two choices. You, you keep getting asked, what's it about? You, your, 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 your two instinctual responses are okay, well, I'll just tell you what it's about, um, which actually takes all the power out of the artwork itself, right, which, is, right. which does no service to anybody. Um, or you, you say, well, what do you think it's about? Which is actually probably the right question, but comes off as being sort of smarmy or snarky or 
mm-hmm. or something like you know slightly insulting. So you come up uh, with a cryptic answer. You should say it's a critique of antinomianism. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> huh? And then I just exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a book <laughs> called The Painted Word by Tom Wolfe. Mm. where he says more and more people don't look at the art, they look at the philosophy behind the art, and they spend more time reading the artist's statement Absolutely. than looking at the work. Yeah, so I, before working at Wheaton College, I actually worked for a museum, and mm. I, was a, I was an exhibition designer. And so there's a real, um, a real tricky part of the design is how much text do you put, mm-hmm. uh, and um, you know, how do you stop people from, there, there's actually statistics on this, like, People spend roughly three times as long reading the text as they do actually looking at the artwork. Oh, okay. And so, um, so yeah, so what do you write? What do you not write? Where do you put it? How big do you put it? Um, there's actually a lot of sort of complex design issues about what seems like a very obvious thing. Like, what is the label? Where do you put the label? Mm. So, actually, if you... If you go to like the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the things you'll find is that labels aren't always right next to the artwork. Oh. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's very intentional. Yeah. To keep, like you have to like, in, you have to counter the work and then you have to look around and find the label. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's. How about a label is just a picture of the artwork? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. What does this mean? <laughs> right. Oh, there it is. Okay. Right. <laughs> so. Well, Sayers repeatedly in the mind of the maker, as well as in her correspondence, talks about the importance of the medium Mm. and that's important in the work I'm doing on Sayers and cinema because people do the same thing with film. They, especially Christians will look at a movie and say, Oh, here's what it's about. Here's Mm -hmm. what we can learn from it. Right. And they are not valuing the artistry of it. Right. In and of itself. Right. So I, and actually that's the interesting thing is you sort of asked me what classes I, I mentioned the first one, which is, um, Sculpture One. I actually I use it in a, a class, a foundations class called Creativity and Design, which is primarily for majors. That's so like mm. the first class that many freshmen take. Um, and then I hit it again in senior capstone. Wow. So uh, so one of the things I try to do is is you know sort of use it to bookend their their education because yeah. it That's it means smart. something different at different mm. points right. in their mm. career. Yeah. Um, but. One of the things that I think is very difficult for people who are not artists, non artists to um to value is um the the stuffness of the art. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for artists that is super hyper critical. I mean, that's what it's that's where everything happens. It is so much about a collaboration between yourself and the material. Um, and that's why it's not just about an idea. Like the art mm-hmm. is not just about an original idea. There's something that's happening in the incarnation of the idea right. that, that, that in affects and infuses itself into the idea. And then there's also something that happens really powerful when that idea, both when the artwork, the incarnation of the work both feeds back to the artist directly, but also feeds back to the artist by the interaction it has with the viewer. Mm. So, um, and all of those things are constantly cycling around which is which is what Sayers is really talking about right. and uh and you can see what you're talking about actually in the book as she talks about like importance of words like you know yes. that's her medium and also character development mm-hmm. and what character development is and what it isn't and one of the really powerful two I mean actually two powerful insights to me about um Dorothy Sayers and using this model this trinitarian model is uh the idea that you are giving your creation free will yeah. which is very mm-hmm. um which is very difficult to do. Yeah. But um but I think super hyper important and also um the idea that you are you serve it that it you creating out of love uh and that love extends to the viewer but it also is about the love of the material and the making and the process mm-hmm. and how important that process is um so um I mean, those are in some ways, I think things that I, when I read the book, it didn't necessarily tell me something new that I felt. It put words to things that I had felt and then were instinctually part of it. And so that's where I think, as I said, as a, as, as her, as an artist, as a, as a writer talking to me as a visual artist, I was like, yes, I know that. 
Mm-hmm. Like I have known that. I feel that mm-hmm. in my body. It's visceral. And now I have a theology and now for I have it. Words for it. Yes. And those words actually include uh, are are have an amazing theological insight. Mm. And so yeah, it tied things. You know, I was a um an artist that was being trained in the 80s and 90s, which is like the height of the culture wars. So mm. the idea that you could be a visual artist and a Christian was like uh-huh. not really on the table mm-hmm. from either side, from either camp. Right. But, uh, right, right. And so that has been bridged, I think, little by little. And there's still some tension there, but it's not nearly the tension that it was when I was going through school. Mm. I want to go back to the idea of giving the... Uh, the work of art, free will. Yeah, there's a thing that happens to most novelists. It happened to me in a novel I wrote called "Looking for the King." Commercial break. Uh, <laughs> that you create a character for a purpose. Like I'm going to satirize something in this character, and as you start writing the character, they're pushing back. Yeah, and they do. They go, "I don't want to be a stereotype, or right. I don't want to be Used. your vehicle for an yeah. idea." And uh, does that happen to you uh, with ceramics that you somehow yeah. sort of pushing back? I don't yeah, want to be I mean, this kind of a. Absolutely. I think one of the things that um, it doesn't happen to me maybe quite as much right now because I think I've shifted the way I think about what I'm doing from um, I'm trying to say something to I'm exploring a set of questions. And so my approach is a little bit more like a weird scientific experiment oh Mm -hmm. i wonder what happens if this and this and once my approach is that then i um i'm more comfortable saying well it just it's going where it's going Mm. uh and some which is giving it independence which is giving it independence Mm. and free will and um but i definitely went through uh one of the ways i was actually um trying for a long time to um to come to terms with the sort of how how do Christians think about art and 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 how do I put those things together was to adopt very loosely I don't think I would have had words for this but I was in essence adopting a sort of profit model the artist is a prophet mm. um mm. and that when I was in that mode I felt like okay like I've got a the, there's these ideas that I think are going to be important and I need to get them into the work and then work needs to mm-hmm. I mean to make sure it communicates you know whatever x is and i i did think there was many sometimes that worked out uh sometimes i did sort of create the sort of mock stereotypical uh, automaton character (laughs) uh and and i would just i would you know kind of look at it and and recognize this says exactly what i wanted it to say and it's no good like it's just Mm. not Uh interesting yeah um but there were also in uh, what i think was really more helpful to me was kind of what you're saying. I would set up, uh, I remember I was trying to make a work that was actually about my faith in a positive light, um, struggling with some of this just out of graduate school. Mm. Um, and it turned really sour. Like it, it, it became like a criticism of the church itself. Mm. Uh, Mm. In, and I recognized at some point it was going that way. And I recognized I needed to let it go that way. And I needed to be okay with that. And, um, and I think it was, from my vantage point and experience, it was a proper criticism of the church, which is, again, that's well, actually what prophets do, right? So, um, uh, but yeah, there was a, I remember a particular piece actually that, that changed on me uh, mm. in that way. Mm. And, Did you preach to it? Paul says in Romans, the, you know, the, <laughs> the pot shouldn't talk back to the potter. No, well, do I, you ever have to preach to your? No, works I don't of art? think. I don't think I've. I, I, I definitely feel more like um, a collaborator mm. uh, with the with the work I'm making mm. than a ma- like. I I tell students this all the time. My my official degree title is a master of fine arts, and I hate that title because I yeah. I mm. I think the idea that I master a material or a process is actually completely the antithesis of what's healthy. Mm. So what and would you so, call yourself? Well, I would say I'm, I mean, if anything, if I would have to say I'm a, I'm the, I'm a servant, I'm a, I'm a servant mm. of fine art. I'm mm. not a master of fine art. Mm. That'd be a uh, great degree. Right. I know yeah. it's, it's, it's a much healthier way of thinking about things. I think mm. it's harder to 
it's harder to live into right um mm. um but it's i mean it's I th- obviously a, it's in a way it's a kind of a theologically better way to think about things mm. um and what you're yeah. describing fulfills one of the paradigms that Sayers is trying to communicate in Mind of the Maker in so far as you have this Trinitarian model of the Mm -hmm. idea that you give energy to as you bring it into being and it has power. But she says the first person it has power on is the artist, him or herself. Right. So you are changing, you are responding to the incarnation of your idea in a collaborative way, right? Like the Trinity itself, they yep. are three distinct persons, right? In um, one substance, yeah. And that's mm. where, um, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I, again, I, it's so hard to th- talk about the Trinity at all. But and, and she does this amazing job of doing it. But to recognize that um, the Trinity is relational, like, wh- yes. like we, we, we talk about the Trinity is three persons and three and one. But as soon as you say three and one, I think this really confused, right? But it's a relationship. It's all about a relationship. And so um, to start thinking about what I'm doing as an artist is about a relationship or, or mm-hmm. uh, actually not a, in this, in this case, not a relationship, but, but numerous relationships, my relationship with the material, my relationship with my ideas, my relationships with viewers, my relationship with space, you know, my relationship mm-hmm. with volume, which is weirdly important to me. Um. Mm. Uh, then, well, for a sculptor, yeah, it I, would right. Be. So depth, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that extra D. I, I, I think. Sorry. So two D, three D, right? Oh. So <laughs> the extra D. So the um, I my my other joke for students is that you know all three D work is superior to all two D work by an entire D. I mean, it's right <laughs> there. It's right there in the title. Um, but yeah, depth and volume and and space and mass. Those are are um organizing uh principles for me that have really that are that are essential to my work Mm. you told us once about when you fire a piece in a wood kiln you actually build a certain level of chance or free will Mm -hmm. into the way because the the way the flames and the smoke enwrap the piece are going to create a, a different final design so that's definitely someone who's relinquishing control over the final product. I, I think that a lot of my, again, I think my, oftentimes the way that I work and think and what I'm attracted to is very instinctual and ceramics as a discipline to me. Um, one of the things that sort of instinctually led me to it is this sense of letting go that, um, ultimately you can't be entirely in control of everything that happens. And after you make a piece and you, you know, um, and do everything you can to make it so that you hope that it will survive and not, you know, be right and survive because they can blow up in the kiln. Right. So, um, there's this way in which you have to give it, give that control over to something else. And I don't know why that, I I mean, as I say that, that does not sound appealing at all, But, (laughs) but something in the way that I, that I create that feels right and yeah. so when it's very christian you know, well, giving control I, I mean, over yeah I, I mean maybe it's actually a uh the way that my faith kind of plays into the way yeah. i think about work i don't i don't actually know where that came from mm. but um i i like the idea of um that it's not just about me mm. in, in a lot of ways or it's not just about my skill and so i've, I've actually gravitated towards a lot of art projects that are not necessarily skill-based but are based on other ideas about routine and ritual and, um, and, and commu- building community and things like that. So mm-hmm. pottery for me is, uh, making pottery, which is one of the things that I do is, is very much about, um, uh, the, I have certain skills, but the skills are all utilized towards the idea of making things that bring people together. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, actually what motivates me is not how great I can throw a pot. But what motivates me is um, what happens, how does, how does the work itself serve uh, this role in community of bringing people together? Mm. That's more noble than how much can I sell this pot for? Yeah, well, that that's be... in there too. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the other kind of profit. <laughs> I mean, there has to be some of that. Okay, yeah. all right. Like, yeah. You okay. know what I love too about Sarah's ability to take sophisticated 
art theory and theology and make it understandable mm-hmm. to a lay person. Even the title of her book, The Mind of the Maker, she is reflecting what is known in Latin as the Imago Dei, which is from Genesis 127, which tells us that all humans, both male and female, were created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. And so that when we are creative, she believes, is when we best fulfill the Imago Dei, because Genesis 127, the God that is presented there, is not a lawgiver, is not a judge, the God is creator. Mm -hmm. And so if we are created in the image of that creator, we fulfill the likeness of God when we are creative, which could apply, and you said this right at the start, it's not just about great writers or great um, uh, visual artists. Right. Even someone who, like a stay-at-home dad who decides that he needs to come up with a new recipe that will satisfy his children while feeding them in a healthy way, comes up with an idea for a recipe and then gives it energy by putting the ingredients together, but then tastes it. So the power of the recipe he is responding mm-hmm. to, he tinkers with it more until it has power for his kids. Right. And so this could relate to all of us. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, as you know, like she ends the book with a chapter that sort of is trying to have a much more expansive view about what it means to be creative and to invite lay people into really thinking of themselves as creative. Um. Gosh, there's so much you said there that I would love to unpack. Um, but yeah, so the one of the things there is that, um, I mean, I think about the power of words because you know, at some people have have labeled themselves. We self-identify so much based on something that was probably said to us when we were in very formative years, mm-hmm. early school years, and so. You know, students will come to me and, you know, in a class and they'll say, oh, you know, I would take that class, but I'm not very creative. Yes. yes. Right? Just like this, the person who says like, oh, I can't draw. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm always like, can you take a pencil and <laughs> drag it across a piece of paper? Because that is officially a drawing. <laughs> um, but um, but that idea that we're not creative, uh, the, to, to say those words uh, are actually very wounding. Yes. And, um, you know, business people are super creative. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if, to be successful at business, you you're mm-hmm. using a lot of creativity to be, right. a, to be a good parent, to be a good pet owner. I mean, yeah. it, it, there's so many different versions of vocation, mm-hmm. um, that all of that is requiring enormous amounts of creativity. And, and we, we need to learn what you're just exactly what you're saying, the, the Imago Dei, that if we are in, if we, if we truly believe we're in made in the image of God, that we need to actually, um, own our own creativity. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of us do. Uh, I think I've told you before as a ceramicist, you can call yourself an an Imago clay. Yes. (laughs) 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 David, I'm glad you got that in. Um, Yeah, He's so, been waiting this know, whole right, right, interview right. <laughs> to insert that. Uh, one of the things that about being a, uh, you could see I'm like immediately jumping in the other direction. No, not really. <laughs> but uh, one of the things about being um, a creator, or being made uh, as a creator, as a creative being, um, made in the image of God, the more radically startling, impossible, um, gift and responsibility that goes along with that is that we are then we are then invited to be co-creators mm. uh and so it's not that just that god creates us to be creative he then says okay like help bring the new kingdom in mm-hmm. yeah uh that's that's shocking i mean mm. <laughs> that's that's in, that's absolutely insane <laughs> mm-hmm. um but in it, but in its absolutely, you know, in this incredibly beautiful way that is so beyond my capacity for understanding, because of course he knows we're going to be lousy at it. Yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't stop us, right? He 
he again it's the free will like right he invites you to be co-creators he knows you're not going to get it right he's willing to say you know do the best you can and i'll fix the things that you get wrong um that's and and i think you were sort of mentioning as, as a stay-at-home dad which i was um that idea of saying you know i want you to be creative i'm going to clean up your messes ultimately mm-hmm. um i will help you get better at it but um that's just a humbling incredibly humbling thing to try mm-hmm. to, to to really absorb about yourself yes be creative yes make a mess um i know you're going to make a mess but you'll get some things right too mm-hmm. like you can actually you you have the power to begin to get things right as well so the, uh, the art historian yaroslav pelican said there's an old conundrum can god make a rock that he cannot lift and pelican says yes he did do that it's called human consciousness mm. And yeah. it is interesting that he would create creatures who could become co-creators, who could choose the good on their own. Yeah. Uh, one mystic I was reading said that God is already infinitely good, and the only way he could create more good beyond infinite good is create creatures who could choose the good or make the beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting mm. concept. Yeah. Nice. Now, I, I, mean, and, I, mean, I mean, yeah, that's just, again, it is an incredible concept. Um, it just makes me think about so many things and what is the nature of beauty and I mean, a lot of this conversation then i keep i keep falling back into well what does it mean for me as a visual artist to you know to look search, seek for beauty what is the beauty where do i find the beauty what do i do with the brokenness um what do i do with my mistakes or what in what ways are my mistakes mistakes or not mistakes um what am i willing to show people uh the all of those kind of things become mm. like much more heightened uh, mm. awareness. I, another thing that's actually in a way kind of goes along with that for me is um, the other thing that I love about her model was, which is the, um, the Holy spirit or, or the power of the work model, which feeds back into the loop is to say that the viewer is not passive whether the viewer yes. is the artists or other people. And so um, there's an empowerment also, I think, to everybody who feels like they don't understand art or, or they, mm. they're afraid of art or they're afraid of contemporary art. There's actually a, a kind of invitation that says, actually, the way you think about it is, is important. Like, you're actually part of it mm-hmm. as a viewer. We have a very um, practical example of that here in the Wade Center. We had an artist named Sally Breston Hale who did a very dynamic, vivid uh, picture, acrylic painting of Aslan. Mm. And when she first exhibited it, uh, she was going through a difficult time. And so it's very much, she says, Aslan is good, but he's not safe. There's a lot of light and dark. When she exhibited it, uh, one of the viewers said, well, I also see the lamb that was slain there and Mm. actually pointed out to the artist a head and some dangling forelegs and some dangling rear legs and she said her own painting ministered to her because she yeah. remembered in her time of trial that the, the great lion is also the lamb that was slain that he's been through everything that we go through yeah and it was a very strange feedback loop that her painting she's an art therapist and her own painting was ministering to her yeah that's so, amazing yeah i i've had a somewhat similar experience with, with the work ministering to me um uh Actually, some of the work I made in grad school was pretty aggressive, and uh, I, I guess maybe, and in, in some ways, it related it related a lot to death, um, and my working out some feelings about death that were related to me losing my father, um, mm. and uh, so it, it was dark. You know, there was there was a lot of sort of dark work that was kind of coming out of of what I was doing in grad school, and. I exhibited the work and um a guy I, I wasn't actually there but a guy came in and saw the work and um the the gallery owner said he wept at the work and he wanted mm. to buy work and mm. he said he was a vet and um the work mm. um he said the guy who made this must have been must be a vet uh, and there was something about his traumatic experiences mm. that my work seemed to be relating to and that turned into a totally new 
way of that work being powerful to me mm. and recognizing that there was a certain kind of, and it was, I, I mean, I'm sure it was infinitely less traumatic than the tra- trauma he was going through, but it sort of made me realize, yeah, I'm actually dealing with this sort of this trauma that's in my life, in my work, which I would have never, I knew I was making work with like skulls in it or, you know, mm-hmm. that, that was referencing death, but I never actually realized that it was kind of referencing this trauma in my life until mm-hmm. somebody else seeing the work saw, had, saw the power mm-hmm. of trauma in the work. And then I suddenly realized, yeah, this is actually kind of where this is, this is coming from this place. Um, so weirdly it was, it's all became healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping that it was in some way healing for him. Just if nothing else, that recognition that somebody else has some kind of experience that relates to the experience you have that in and of itself is a kind of healing connector. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'd, I, and that's also, you were, I mean, that really even goes back to giving your work free will because I was kind of making this work mm. and just, just letting it go where it was going to go and not trying to control what it was doing. And I didn't know what it was doing. I, d- I knew it was interesting to look at, um, but I didn't really know exactly what it was doing. So, yeah. Mm. Didn't you say that Sayers writing The Zeal of Thy House was very much a, a spiritual experience for her? Mm-hmm. It gave her a new um, respect for sanctity and um, just the, the godlike powers of the, of the artist or the sculptor. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where she came up with her tripartite mm. sense of the Imago Dei. It was the, an angel at the end of the play. And a, a theologian read the the play they had taken it out of the first performance because mm. they thought it was just a little, a little too, too much. philosophical yeah, yeah, yeah. and then a theologian read it and said you're doing something here i have not seen before mm. you need to expand this into a book and that became yeah. the mind wow. of the maker that's awesome mm. but it was an act of creativity right. that came back on her the exact way that you are right. describing so, so again just to say the viewer Yes. The like viewer. the viewer is, is part of the, of the feedback loop. It's part, yes. it's necessary. Um, and, uh, anyway, so I would encourage everybody really. And I encourage my students again, I have a lot of students who are not majors and I'm like, look, you have, you have a role, you have a, a purpose in going to the art Institute and seeing artwork. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're valuable. You're valuable right. as part of it. You're part of it. Um, and yeah. so, um, yeah, that I think is, again, there's, so many pieces to this book mm-hmm. that I just think are, it's not taught that way in school. It's not taught that way in art school. If you go to the art Institute, they don't talk about artwork this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but I think it instinctually, they might oftentimes put different words to it, but it's the way a lot of artists feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a lot mm-hmm. of the people who I talk to, if I, if I don't necess- if they're not Christians and I don't necessarily bring up, that the idea is directly related to the Trinity, but I sort of talk about this full feedback. Everything is kind of connected. Mm-hmm. It's not just about an idea. They, many of them will say, yep, that's, that's exactly, that's mm-hmm. instinctually how I feel. About mm-hmm. it, so, Thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. This has been a very stimulating conversation. Yes. Very stimulating and edifying. <laughs> Well, I hate to do anything edifying, but it's okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, David. Yeah. You bet.